thanks very much for that very kind introduction. I'm not sure I've come totally out the other end. I think there's still, there's still trauma. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, it has been a journey, I can tell you. Uh, before uh, 2012, I was not even remotely an expert, and nor do I consider my an expert, really, truly, in really early phase trials. But I have had now experience learning and being educated, and it's an ongoing iterative process that I'll share with you today. Um, so just to get started, I'll just start off with very briefly discussing the different clinical trial phases and the rationale for them to get us all up to speed of where we think m most of you will be at translating something from the bench to the bedside. And then I'm going to drill down and really start to focus on, on phase one, very basic trial design principles. Because again, I think that's where the vast majority uh, in the room will be at. And then I'll use our KISS trial, our phase one KISS trial as sort of a clinical design template to take you through some of the considerations that we used when we were uh, in the design, uh, the design phase for that study. And then Jose is going to talk to you a lot more about the regulations and the actual CTA submission to Health Canada. Okay. So, the clinical trial design really truly is influenced by the developmental, uh, the developmental phase of a given intervention. So let's just say we think we've got all that preclinical data, we've got adequate rationale and, and, and safety data as well in our preclinical studies to justify going forward to now a trial, a first in human trial. Um, so really what you need to do, the first thing you need to do is a phase one study and these studies are really, really focused on evaluating safety. You've heard the words a few times, safety, it's safety, 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 because they're going into humans and it's a big, it's a big deal. In these trials you also try to, to determine the optimal dose so that when you go forward to a, your second trial really, which is a phase two trial, then you can start using that dose to say, hmm, are there hints at clinical efficacy? Are there hints where the outcomes in my patients are improved compared to the control group? And these are typically more surrogate outcomes of efficacy rather than definitive outcomes. So definitive outcome would be something that we use in a phase three trial. Um, a definitive outcome would be like death. The problem is that we don't use death as a, as a definitive outcome in a phase two trial because a death outcome requires typically hundreds to thousands of patients and a couple hundred million dollars potentially in a, in a regenerative medicine trial. So what you got to do is you got to build your argument. You say, oh, do your phase two, are there surrogate measures of efficacy in this phase two trial that then give you the justification along with safety to then go forward to a phase three trial. Now phase two and phase three trials are randomized, typically randomized controlled trials. And the reason Dr. Lou explained very nicely that we use randomization where we randomly allocate a patient that meets your eligibility criteria to the intervention versus the control group. The reason we do that is, is to prevent imbalances between the two groups. And then by, and you accidentally saying, oh, I think the intervention's great because my patients did better in this group. But if the reality is if you didn't randomize and group A had all 80-year-olds, I'm not ageist, but all 80-year-olds plus, and group B had all 40-year-olds, and they all had severe infection, and you measure that outcomes, who do you think would do better? Probably not the 80-year-olds, right? I think we're, we can all sort of come up with that conclusion. So randomization is a process whereby you balance those important baseline characteristics between those two study groups so that you can actually do fair comparisons. Phase four trials are so... One more thing on phase three. So phase three trials, going from phase two to phase three. Phase three are much larger studies, as I said, where are typically powered to look at definitive clinical outcomes with much larger sample sizes. And a lot of the times, too, we start to get a little bit more broad with our eligibility criteria. So instead of having a really specific, well-defined inclusion criteria for patients where the, where the intervention wouldn't be very generalizable to the total population. In phase three trials, we start to spread out a little bit and say, oh, okay, well, maybe we'll let those patients into the trials that do have some chronic comorbid diseases to see if the intervention is still as effective as what we found in the phase two trial. And then phase four trials are really post-marketing studies. So you've got your license for the drug, and then the, you continue uh, more in an observational way to continue to follow these patients forward for their clinical outcomes as well as, um, as well as safety and particularly long-term adverse effects because typically in a clinical trial, they don't usually follow them out for five to ten years. It's maybe three months, six months, one year. Okay, so as I was saying, I'm going to drill down a little bit more now and focus on phase one. So as I was saying, for a phase one clinical trial, you're really trying to make sure that the, the, the drug that you're using or the intervention you're using is safe. 
In some respects, you're trying to understand as well how, the, how that drug affects the human body. And sometimes you'll, you'll actually look for little surrogate measures of efficacy, but we know darn well in a phase one trial with a very small sample size, without an adequate control group, without randomization, that inferring cause and effect in that context is extremely difficult and very limited. But if you see some positive signals, it sort of gives you that impetus to say, yeah, I'm ready now to go to phase two. The patients for these trials, um, sorry, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that in a phase one trial, they're typically a dose escalation design, which I'll explain a little bit more in a minute, and you continue to escalate your dose until you reach some form of predefined dose limiting toxicity. The patients that are eligible for these phase one first in human trials typically have no, either no known effective treatment or they've tried all other treatments first and there's no further treatments available for them. And so their, their outcomes without that further new treatment would be very poor. So that's kind of the, the framing for these phase one trials. There may or may not be a control group and more on that in a little bit. And as I was saying, the, the sample sizes are quite small. Okay. So population. When you're starting your clinical trial and you're selecting your patients for your clinical trial, your patient should be at high risk for the, out, the ultimate outcome for phase two. Because you're always thinking, somebody else was saying, you're always thinking, what's the end game? What's going to be the next phase? So what, is the, what are the clinical outcomes in this study that you're going to be aiming for? And are the patients that actually, that you're enrolling, will they actually have the opportunity to have a clinical outcome? So for example, in, our, in my sort of domain where we study severe infection they're called septic shock, if I was to enroll patients that just had sepsis and I had mortality as my outcome, those patients wouldn't likely, there's very few patients that would actually get that outcome of death just as, as in a control group because they're not sick enough. So you need to think about who the patients are that you're enrolling. You also need to think about, you know, patients that would potentially be harmed by the treatment. So who are the patients that wouldn't likely stand to benefit from the treatment? So for example, if I have somebody with septic shock and that patient has lots and lots of long-term severe comorbid illnesses, severe coronary disease, severe valvular disease, severe liver disease, the likelihood that that patient will die from their underlying illness that now has an infection is extremely high. And the likelihood that you'll be able to benefit that patient from the intervention that you're employing in those early phases is, is pretty darn unlikely. So you need to think about that as well. Also in your patient population, you have to balance this with, hmm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define my patient population, but I need to be able to recruit patients into it. <sighs> I knew that was going to happen. Anyway, um, so you need to think, be a little bit practical and, a little, and think about feasibility. Can you actually get the patients enrolled that you're identifying for recruitment into this trial? And that's a big, big deal in clinical trials. Clinical trials fail due to failure for recruitment. So it's about doing your homework. Okay, so the dose part, the dose escalation part. So start safe. <laughs> and we'll go through what we, the criteria that we use in our KISS trial to, to come to what was the safe starting dose for the dose escalation um, study. Minimize, the principle is to minimize the number of patients that are treated at a lower subtherapeutic doses and escalate rapidly in the absence of toxicity and then slow down if you do have presence of toxicity. It doesn't sound like rocket science, does it? But it's just keeping those principles in mind because the, the idea here is that you want to, to get to an, an, opt, an optimal dose for use in a further phase three or phase two trial but um, you want to get there as efficiently as possible because you don't want to expose a whole like a thousand patients to subtherapeutic doses and take 10 years to do so because that's not ethical either. So you have to balance the benefit and the risk as you're going along and this is, this is challenging. <laughs> so fundamental questions to answer in phase one trials are really to identify what that dose limiting toxicity is that then helps you determine what the maximum tolerated dose is to use in your phase two trial and at least not so much in MSC or mesenchymal stromal cell trials but we try in, in many phase one um, uh, trials to assess drug metabolism and clearance but I put a big question mark here for MSCs because to be honest we don't right now have a really good method for actually uh, assessing MSC persistence in the vasculature over time. So it is a challenge and there are many folk that are working and thinking about this that needs to be developed into the future. Okay. So then for dose, you start saying, oh, okay, well, what dose should we start at? How should you escalate it? How many patients should be at each dose? 
How do you define dose limiting toxicity? And then how do you define the maximum tolerated dose in your, in your phase one trial? So dose limiting toxicities are, are toxicities that either due to their severity or their duration are considered unacceptable and limit further dose escalation. And it can also be that toxicity that aborts your trial. These dose limiting toxicities need to be advanced and discussed well in advance of starting your clinical trial. We spent a lot of time on this. Um, and you need to think about the temporal association of that toxicity with the administration of your drug. So if you say, oh, um, I'm going to look at the occurrence of arrhythmias as a dose limiting toxicity for my drug, but the arrhythmias, you know, happen three weeks after the drug's administered only then there's a very high likelihood that that arrhythmia is not, doesn't have anything to do with the drug that was, is administered. So you need to think about the temporal association when you're a priori defining what those are. And, and I'll give you some examples from our KISS trial too. So the classic, the classic dose escalation design is a rule-based design. And, we, and there are different types, but this is the classic one that I'll take you through, and it's three by three. So really it, it is cohorts of three patients. And as I was saying, you begin at your starting dose that is considered to be safe and then you have subsequent cohorts of three patients where the dose is escalated. And if there's no dose limiting toxicity in a given cohort, then you proceed to the next dose increment. But if a dose limiting toxicity is, um, it happens, you also have an independent data safety and monitoring committee that is reviewing the data after, after conclusion of each dose cohort, as well as if a serious unexpected adverse event happens, to these patients and you think that that is attributed to the drug, then that would also cause the DSMC to review. And in that review, the DSMC can, can argue that you should suspend or to abort your trial. Or they might say, huh, oh, we're not really sure about the causality. We're not really sure about the attributive causality of that event with the drug. So you know what? Add more patients into that dose cohort and let's just see because we want to get to the maximum tolerated dose. And so that maximum tolerated dose is the dose where there aren't any dose limiting toxicities at that particular level. So here's a pictogram, it's very, very basic, where you start at the, you have your low dose, you have your three patients, and then it, you continue to escalate. After you finish cohort one, you go to cohort two, three, four, five, and at the top there on the left, you've got a DLT in that top cohort. So you go, oh, DLT happened, so DSMC review, DSMC says, stop the trial. It happened within five minutes of administering the drug. It was, the patient died. There's, there, it's like almost certain that it was related to the drug. So you know what? You're not going to use that as your maximum tolerated dose. You're going to go one dose below, and that's your, MT, that's, your, that's your MTD. Or they might say, huh, not sure. Not sure, really, if this can really truly be attributed. So you know what? Add, add some more patients into that cohort and then go from there. Okay. All right. This is not a simple business <laughs> at all. Um, so now what I'm going to do is take you through uh, a few pearls, I guess, that we've learned um, as we went through the design of our phase one uh, KISS trial. So this, this trial is a, um, a trial where we're using mesenchymal stromal cells. These are bone marrow allogeneic derived mesenchymal stromal cells for treating patients with septic shock. Septic shock is a devastating condition that we have in the intensive care unit. It's the most severe form of infection that we see. Mortality rates are 20 to 40 percent. It's the most common reason why we admit patients to the ICU, and so it's a really, really big problem for us. And because these cells have multiple different potential mechanisms of action in animal models of sepsis um, for actually helping these patients, we went forward with saying, wow, we, we, we've got to study this in humans. So first thing. And this has been a theme throughout the whole morning, build your team. Oh my gosh, there are so many moving parts. There's just absolutely no way that you can be the expert and nor should you be um, for all these different parts. You need to have your consultants there with you. So in 2012, when we started this, there were multiple different people coming together from different disciplines um, to build the team. So we have stem cell scientists, expertise that, you know, renowned in the world, Duncan Stewart and Shirley May, a translational sepsis scientist who's the, who's the KISS translational lead, Dean Ferguson, who is a methodologist, clinical, senior clinical trialist, and David Cortman, who is our GMP director and manufacturing expert. And then there's so many other people that are working under each of those domains, be it translational manufacturing, backgrounds, methods work. People like Manoj Lalou have, have done some of the systematic reviews that have helped support going forward to the phase one clinical trial. And then you have the clinical coordinators 
And these folk are gold for you because they can actually help you with the feasibility and the trial operations and what's practical. Sometimes a coordinator will come to me and say, well, Laurel, and that doesn't make any sense, trying to include that type of patient, because you'll never get them. Like, who are you kidding? That type of thing. So they can really help you with those, uh, with those granular bits in the trial design phase. So for our, our design, when we were first thinking about this, because the, these cells had never been given to any humans with septic shock, we all, although there had been an, a number of trials that, that had given MSCs that for uncontrolled as well as controlled clinical trials, we said, you know what, we need to, um, we need to start with a phase one dose escalation trial for sure. And we also said because it was such a highly experimental intervention, there was no way we were going to give these cells to healthy volunteers because we really didn't have any established long-term safety profile. So we said we need to go with patients that actually have septic shock. But we framed it, because we didn't want to give them to just any patient with septic shock. We framed it as a, what we call a rescue intervention, almost akin, to, I think, to, to, to cancer therapeutics, where patients have gone through a number of different therapies, and the therapies are, all the therapies are now failing, and there's really no other therapy, so now what can you try? So we had patients that had septic shock that had received all usual care treatments, and then they were either not getting better or they were continuing to get worse, and those are the patients that we enroll in our phase one trial. In addition to that, getting back to that, having a, a potential signal, number one for safety and maybe surrogate measures of efficacy, we excluded patients that, didn't ha that had really, really bad, severe comorbid diseases that were very highly likely to die due to their underlying severe comorbidities in this phase one trial. And then we spent a lot of time with our research coordinators also thinking about how we can rec recruit these patients and, we've, and um, we questioned it because our, our trial el eligibility criteria were really tight. So before we actually started enrolling, we had a control group, a prospectively enrolled control group. Now this control group was critical for us <laughs> for a number of reasons. Not only did it give us experience enrolling the patients into this control group that met our KISS eligibility criteria, it also gave us experience collecting adverse events because adverse events in septic shock happen just every day because the patients are so incredibly ill. And in our context, and I think in many, in many contexts, it's important to have that control group to compare the adverse events in your interventional group because these are regulated trials. These are very early phase trials and so you have to have a feel for how common are these adverse events just by virtue of the patients being very, very sick. It also gave the opportunity for us to train the DSMC committee before the interventional arm started so they had a feel as well for the occurrence of these adverse events in this patient population that we were going to enroll. Oh, and I haven't even talked about the MSC intervention and that we could go on for a day about that, but just very, very briefly, the whole GMP, when you when girls were talking about this, I was like, oh, it's, it's so daunting and what you do is amazing and yeah, what they do at the OHRI as well, David Corbett in the lead is, is amazing, um, but, <laughs> but we won't go there today because there's just too much other stuff to discuss, but we needed to think about what, what was our cell source we went with bone marrow because at the time, bone marrow, uh, MSCs, uh, at least for preclinical studies, were the, the most well-studied cells. Um, and then there was that whole fresh versus cryopreserved. We use a fresh cell versus a cryopreserved. And we went with fresh for the phase one trial because at the time there were pretty strong data that suggested that cryopreserved cells didn't work. Since that point, though, there's more data actually being published now that, there's, that that is not a black or white issue and that there's probably a lot more, it's probably a lot more to do with how the cells are handled and processed and dethawed with regard to their potency. And so, and, and having a crowd preserved product, as you can imagine, in a much larger trial that involves patients from across geographic country would be really, really important. But for phase one, we went with, went with fresh. And then we needed to think about the timing. So patients with septic shock get real sick real fast. They develop multiple organ failures within 24 to 48 hours. And so you needed to think about and sort of bridge from the, from the preclinical data how biologically plausible, like when should we be giving these cells in terms of when they might have their therapeutic effect and when it might be most safe. And then we needed to think about you know, what, was our, what dose did we start at and what would be our maximum dose. So our low dose really came from other trials that were published from our, our safety systematic review that we did that was led by Dr. Lelou um, that really helped to, us to say, okay, well, there doesn't seem to be any adverse events or any signals for safety in these, in these doses up to 
five, five by 10 to the six cells per kilo. Um, so we're gonna start a lot lower than that. So we started at 0.3 by 10 to the six cells per kilo to almost give what we would consider a homeopathic dose in, the, in, this, uh, in this setting. We also used a, a recent trials in the acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome, which is another really uh, bad critically ill problem that we see um, in our critically ill patients where uh, an early phase one dose escalation trial uh, had just been concluded. And so we talked to the investigator and we, and we collaborated and, and he shared information with us that gave us again more confidence that the doses that we were starting with and that we were going to the maximum uh, were reasonable. And then we also needed to think about the dosing interval within a cohort and to the subsequent cohort. The other big thing was safety. As I was saying, Health Canada, and so are we, quite frankly, it's all about safety. You've got to ensure the safety of the patients that you put into the trial. So you need to have predefined trial suspension rules. And essentially, those are those, I was talking about the dose limiting toxicity, those are your suspension rules. And so we define criteria for suspending the trial, we define criteria for where we added an additional pa patient to a cohort and where we would abort the trial. We also characterized and monitored for adverse events, specifically serious adverse events that were considered unexpected in this population as well as expected. We needed to define the frequency and the time window for capture of those adverse events. So do you just capture them for a week, two weeks, four weeks? This is all, and it's very labor intensive to do all of this. So you need to think about, you need to think about the safety window and you need to think you need to think about how long practically and feasibly you can actually collect that data for that will also satisfy Health Canada. We consulted with our research institute about the protocol and our safety monitoring. Experienced ICU research coordinators how to operationalize the monitoring for safety and our research ethics board. And we went to Health Canada and we had a pre-CTA meeting just to, dis to discuss all of this. Um, as another speaker alluded to, I think Julia talked about it this morning, um, very, very important um, meeting that we had with Health Canada to make sure that they thought what we, we were planning was, was reasonable. And there are guidance documents out there for clinical, for clinical trials that I've just referenced at the bottom of the slide. Um, there that give you the sort of the guide for the conduct of, uh, uh, of clinical trials according to the practice that needs to be done um, to assure the safety of the enrolled patients. Okay, so just very quickly, the criteria that we used to suspend our trial was if there was a, 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 a pre, we had a pre-specified MSC infusion associated adverse events. So if that event happened, we said that if they got really unstable from the lung perspective or from a cardiovascular perspective within 30 minutes, up to 30 minutes after the cells were infused, and there was no other reason to explain it, that would cause the trial to be suspended. If a, a serious unexpected adverse event happened within our clinical trial, that would also cause the trial to be suspended. Or if the patient died within the 24 hours after cessation of the MSC infusion, that would cause the trial to be suspended. And if the event was considered possibly or related to the study drug or study procedure, then that, again, that causes the suspension of the study pending review of the DSMC. Okay. So this is what our phase one trial study design ended up looking like. So on the left, we have our observation, or what we call our KISS, observational arm where we enrolled 21 patients that met our eligibility, our predefined eligibility inclusion exclusion criteria within 24 hours of getting into the ICU. And then we had to think, oh, because we were using fresh cells, we needed to get the cells ready for infusion. So we had to give an extra six hours in order to get consent and then to actually get the cells ready for infusion. So we actually had a 30 hour eligibility window there. And then as I was saying, those for those patients, we really collected their clinical outcomes and their adverse events, and we also collected their blood serially for biomarkers of inflammation to try and get at the biology, the surrogate, surrogate measures of efficacy, if you will. And then in the interventional arm, on the other side, we enrolled a total of nine patients. Again, same eligibility criteria, same enrollment window. After consent was obtained, we had an extra measure of safety in there in that they had to meet pre-specified monitoring parameters for saying, they are stable for this hour in terms of their lung and their, and their cardiovascular system before we put them in. If they were continuing to deteriorate and fall off the cliff, we wouldn't put those patients into the trial because it was just way too high risk in order to get them enrolled. And then we had the three different dose cohorts that escalated from 0.3 then to 1 to 3 by 10 to the 6 cells per kilo with a DSMC review panel after each cohort or if one of those serious unexpected adverse events occurred within the clinical trial that was attributed to the study drug 
their study protocol. And then we, had, we, we came up with our maximum tolerated dose for our phase two trial on the basis of the high dose and the absence of any dose limiting toxicities, i.e. criteria to suspend the trial that has given us the impetus to go forward to phase two. We're really happy to say that we just had that paper published last week, yay, um, in, the, in the, um, the American Journal of uh, Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. And um, it's given us the confidence and the impetus to now go forward to a, a much larger phase two multi-center Canadian randomized controlled trials that now is starting to look at those surrogate measures of efficacy and continuing to evaluate safety as we move this, uh, this therapeutic through the pipeline, and I want to thank um, the OIRM, Stem Cell Network, and, the o and, and CIHR for providing funding to get this trial up and off the ground. So that is all I have to say for, um, for, the, for my talk, <laughs> and Jose is now going to com come up, and she's going to talk to you more about the CT application. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. So good morning everyone. I know I'm the last speaker before your lunch and the last one in the session. So a little bit of a disclaimer is I am up here and I'm neither a scientist nor um, a physician, but um, I am here to talk to you about regulation. So if you can bear with me for the next 10 minutes or so um, as we review a few of these things. So my objective today is really just to go through some of the uh, clinical trial application processes. So as many of you guys continue on your journey and start thinking about um, how you're going to be translating some of this into a human uh, population, so some of the things that you need to go through and some of the challenges that you may need to consider, especially for those who are investigator-led clinical trials. So um, Health Canada, when you are going through Health Canada, the expertise or the, the, the rigor in which they're going to review your application is going to be the same for you coming, if you're coming from an academic center, as it would be for somebody coming from an industry-led um, place. And I think that adds some challenges um, as, as you move forward. And I'd like to review some of those. And again, using some of the examples that Dr. McIntyre has talked about. So we're going to go through the processes and then use some of the, uh, the, the examples as they relate to KISS. So the first thing really, and I don't know how many of you guys have ever thought about going to Health Canada, but how do you know? How do I know that I need to submit an application to Health Canada? Well, the first thing is if your research involves a new therapy, then it may need to go to Health Canada. But, well, it does need to go to Health Canada. So those, those again, are going to be your phase one and your phase three trials. If you're doing a phase four, which is post-surveillance marketing, um, surveillance, it does not. Um, so does the research use a product or therapy, in our case cellular therapy, that has been approved by Health Canada, but is going to be tested for a new indication in a different patient population, different formulation and or combination, or a new road of administration? If all of these is yes, then an application must be submitted to Health Canada. So all the clinical trials, all clinical trials in Canada are subject to Division 5, um, and this is a Health Canada food and drug regulation, and it is in compliance with a good clinical practice um, as defined by the International Conference on Harmonization. All of these regulatory processes um, apply to any sponsor who is planning on conducting a clinical trial in Canada. So now we've determined that we definitely do need to go in and uh, put our CTA in, and this will go to a different directorate. So dependent on what it is that you are studying, if you're, look, if you're studying a biologic, then you've got the BGTD, which is the Biologic and Genetic Therapeutic Directorate. If you're looking at a drug, it's the TPD, which is a Therapeutic Product Directorate. If you're looking at vitamins, they've got a different directorate for that as well. So dependent on what the product is that you are trying to, that you're bringing through the pipeline, you have different types of directorate to which you are going to be applying for. And this is going to be very important when you're putting your clinical trial application together because some of the guidance documents that you are going to be referencing are going to differ as well. All of the clinical trials that are governed under the Health Canada applications as well, so you are going to receive what we call as a no objection letter. So that's what we all aim to get, but there's also a 
non-satisfactory letter, which, which nobody wants. So in this NOL, which is how we deem it for short, is where you're going to find the directorate to which you are going to be reporting. So just because you did go up and you applied to the TPD, um, they, they may say, yes, you're TPD, but you're also going to be responsible for reporting to the, the, the natural health product directorate as well. So in that NOL, all the applicable regulations that you must follow are going to be explicitly detailed. Furthermore, and I know this isn't really the the, the, the topic that I'm talking about, but I think it's important to consider as you're moving through and developing a lot of these documents is that not only do you need to abide by these guidelines, but there's also the guidelines that we have at the research ethics board level. So these are mostly the tri-council pol uh, tri policy, which is an ethical guideline that is used for when you're conducting research in humans. So you're applying all your Division Five guidelines, you're applying your TCPS, and, but you're also having to consider what your local uh, regulations are as well as any provincial um, privacy laws. So all of these need to be considered and need to be implemented into all the documents that you are going to be generating for the conduct of your trial. So this is just a very broad outlook of what the clinical trial application looks like. It is composed of three different modules. You've got your module one, your module two, and your module three. And it's really hard to do, and I, I, I feel like I've simplified it a lot over here. And I just want to share a little story with you guys. So I'm coming off the heels of doing it. My, my expertise has been mostly in large phase three clinical trials, um, multi-center, international. Um, and this, and Dr. McIntyre had approached me a few, uh, about a year ago now, and knocked on my door and asked me if I would be interested in doing a phase two, 114 patient trial. And they already had a pre-CTA meeting that was organized, and I thought, it's going to be a, a walk in the park. Um, here I am, you know, coming off a 82 site clinical trial. We were in five different countries. We had randomized over 2,500 patients. Um, you know, I thought this was going to be very, very simple. Um, but I'd like to tell you that it's probably easier to import an opiate than it is to generate module two. <laughs> so <laughs> coming from um, a, and again, I was, I was doing phase three and we were using folic acid. Um, so folic acid, the, the investigator brochure, well, it, it, it did not exist, but they had a product monograph. So I was able to use that. So module two never really existed for me before. So when she had approached me and said, oh, we're doing all this, I was like, fantastic. But then I looked at the module two, and I was like, oh, it's, it's not going to be that hard. It's 11 pages long. Um, we are still uh, summarizing our quads a year later, and it is now up to about 70 pages. So for all you translational folk, that's a sevenfold increase. Um, so, so we're getting there, and I'm going to bring you through some of the challenges that are related to some of the documents that I, need, I would like for you to consider when you're continuing on to your journey. So this has kind of been a little bit of a theme that uh, most people have spoken about a little bit this morning, but it's really, really, really important that you involve everybody in this. So use your, anybody in your institution who has already gone through this process, approach them, ask them what they've learned, ask them what has come out of their pre-CTA meetings. They've, they've more than likely submitted the CTA. Was there any feedback that came back? Were there, were there any modifications? What should we anticipate when we're developing the quads, which is our module two, in order to put that in? And I think what's really important, especially for me coming to the table at this point, which is a bit later in the game, and being predominantly always involved in the clinical side, was that I did not know how to communicate with a cell manufacturing facility or the basic lab scientists, you guys were talking about potency and stability and recovery. I had no idea what any of, all, or any of this meant. So it was really important, I think, at that point to, to ensure that, although you're, you're not only building the team, but to ensure that you've got really good communication strategies between the both. So when everybody's going to these, these meetings, you can understand what's going on and how some of these things may actually affect your timelines moving forward. So the first thing is the investigator brochure. So because we are an investigator-led, and this is us that is going to be developing the cellular therapy, this needs to be developed by 
by us. So it's not like we can go to, to Roche and ask them to provide us with the EIB. Um, we are the ones that are having to contribute all the, the, the literature and everything that is all the different components that are that, that compose this document is really based for us. So in for KISS, what we ended up having to do, um, first of all, we, we derive these from healthy bone marrow. So we even need to describe our donation and how we acquire um, the, uh, the, the, the stem cells for the trial. We needed to talk to about how we establish the master cell banks very generally because a lot of this is going to be going into greater detail in the quads. Um, so all these different things, we had to summarize all the toxicology, and I know Dr. Uh, McIntyre has alluded to some of this in her talk, but a lot of that information is, is going to be summarized in this document over here. Another thing is the clinical trial protocol, which again Dr. McIntyre talked about a little bit in, um, in, her, in her talk. Um, so the, 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 the one thing in here that is, is important to to consider, I think, is especially from the, the, the basic science sides, our clinical trial protocols are, are, are larger and then it's populated as well with all the regulations that apply to what it is that you're doing. So a lot of those last sections have to do with record retention and privacy. So all those different components need to be included into the clinical trial protocol. And it's really important that you're involving a lot of the different people um, to, to develop this. So expertise in your field, even some of the patients. Um, because whatever it is that you're submitting to Health Canada, you can't change. So you, you could change, but it's going to require an amendment. So you really want to make sure that you're honing in on all the little details before you're putting it in. The next thing is the informed consent. So anytime that we're putting tr patients into a trial, we need to get their consent for, uh, for moving forward. The informed consent here, which we deem ICF for short, um, describes all these different things. So why, why are we doing the study? What is the design? What is the purpose? But because this is a public facing document, it's really important that we bring it to a very, it's a grade eight level. And sometimes when we're dealing with cellular therapy, it's really hard to do that. So, so again, we have to involve, we've involved um, a lot of patients even from our first, the, the first KISS trial, as well as um, other people who were ICU survivors um, to help us develop this document so that it's, it's something that would be very useful. Um, and then there's the quads. So I'm not going to go, I know uh, <laughs> Gail had talked a little bit about this earlier, but I think the, the biggest thing in, in here is that all of the stability and all of the validation and the, all this data that you're generating in the cell manufacturing facility, this is where it's all going to be summarized. And this is, and everything is not, you don't, you don't just do it once, you have to do it two, three, four times because what you're trying to demonstrate to Health Canada and to all the reviewers is that your product is safe and that everything that you've got in there um, as well that you can not only that you can not, not only say that it's safe but you that you can reproduce it so you have to define even these target benchmarks so that you're going to say okay well if I'm going to have a variability or sorry if I'm going to have a viability it's going to be above 70 percent but if you have something that comes back at 68 percent you can't use that in your trial so all of that work needs to be done before you actually put it in your quads because once you put it in your quads that's what they're going to hold you against. So the additional supporting, uh, so your module three is anything that is going to help you support what you've put into your quads. So this, again, we've, we've talked a little bit about the certificates of analysis. So that goes in there, all the SOPs, and you stole my SOP to write an SOP, but you do. And the other SOP, so that, that I thought was very funny was that when even our cell manufacturing facility were counting their cells, I said, oh, I bet you guys have an SOP for that. I was joking, but they did. Um, so there, there's an SOP for everything. Um, and uh, just a little thing uh, about the, the letter of access. One of the media, uh, one of the re media reagents that we're using in our KISS trial, they didn't even have what we call as a data master file with Health Canada. So this added some complexity to what we needed to do and something that we needed to get done even before thinking of going into Health Canada. So what a data master file is, is generally um, so that the, the company who owns the media would have normally had put this into Health Canada so that when we're putting in 
our, um, our application, we can reference that data master file. And this is kind of part of the whole certificate analysis. So they're not going to obviously give us their formulation for how they're making their media. But we as sponsor in Health Canada, as the, the, the person who's going to authorize this, needs to ensure that whatever is included in that media isn't anything that could be harmful, but they're not going to share any of their IP with us. So then we had to work with this company in Israel to submit a data master file to Health Canada before we can even contemplate putting in a, um, a CTA, because in our CTA application, we now need to reference the DMF. So we had to work with them for a few months um, and then we had to orchestrate many teleconference calls between ourselves and Health Canada to ensure that this was being put in place. And then there's the site feasibility. Um, so so I, this one I, I think is really funny because as, as a coordinator who works a lot in clinical trials, I've had investigators come to me many times and say, oh, Joe, he's going to be great in our trial. We went to school together and we just had a beer in Berlin and he can get lo lots of patients. The problem is, is that when the investigators are asking these questions and they're, you know, gathering all their, their colleagues and their beer buddies, they, they're, they're not asking the specific questions. And the reason I ask that is because now in cellular therapy, when we're moving forward with our trial, it's not so much as asking, oh, do you have the facility to store our clinic, do you have the facility to store the MSCs? Of course they do. They're going to say, yes, I do. But what I want to know is, is it dedicated? Is there anything else in that doer? Um, is it monitored? Is the temperature monitored? Because that's something that we need to do for, for Health Canada. Um, in the event of a shutdown or electrical problem in your facility, what, what are the backup regions? So there's, there's all these different things that, that, that we need to know that we need to specifically ask. And of course, because in order to support the clinical trial as well, we need to write an SOP on it. So, and that's got to go into the module three, but I need to know this, the rigor, the detail, because if I don't put it in there, Health Canada is going to come back to me and they're going to ask me, how do you plan on doing this? So better to think ahead and get this done even prior to going into Health Canada. So the other thing as well that we need to think about, because we are using a cryopreserved product, is that we now, for our final cell product, we've got to thaw, dilute, and infuse. So we had to simulate these studies so that we could see the, I can use it now because I know what it means, but the potency and the viability and the recovery of these cells after the fact. So were they the same, you know, maybe because the mechanics and the pump were doing something to the cells. So we had to do these studies and we had to repeat, 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 and repeat them multiple times to ensure that the variability um, um, was okay. So now that we've kind of talked to you about some of the different components that um, compose our, our, our clinical trial application, I'm just going to bring you very quickly through the process of it. So as Julia talked about this morning, it's really important that we schedule a pre-CTA meeting with Health Canada, especially if you are new to this or this is a very new indication or a new therapy that you plan on bringing through the pipeline. Um, and you can schedule as many as you want. For instance, in, in KISS, we did two. We, we separated out. We did one for the clinical and we wanted to really talk to them about our approach to the safety and if that was okay. And then we, held, we held a separate one for the manufacturing as well. Um, th th this is just one of my tips. <laughs> so before you even go into your clinic, before you even submit to Health Canada, I always think it's advisable that you submit to your REB first. You're not going to get the approval because they require an NOL in order to approve the protocol. But what, what that is going to give you is their comments on your informed consent because your informed consent needs to go into your application. And they are... I have I've been doing this for over 15 years and I've never not once had the REB come back to me and not have any changes on the ICF. So better to get those changes in so that once you do get your NOL, then you don't have to go back in with your revised ICF. So better to get them first and then uh, use their, uh, their feedback to, again, help support your clinical trial application. So then you're going to submit the CTA and within 30 days, you're going to get the NOL. But somewhere between the 21 and 28th day, you're going to possibly get some feedback or some questions from Health Canada. And you have 48 hours to answer them. 
No ifs, ands, or buts about that. You have 48 hours. So it's always best to put as much information as you can in the quaz because if you tell yourself, oh, I don't need to do this, we're going to deal with it later, well, later is going to come quick and you have 48 hours to deal with the later. So better to put it now and to, to make sure that you've got all those logistics lined up. Um, and then you can begin your recruitment after you've received REB, of course. Um, so that's, that, that, that's all I have today. And this is, well, I'm not a basketball player, but I've always, I live by this quote. So uh, talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence wins championships. So thank you for listening.